friends welcome back to another story in the life of the old time rock and roller today it's my great privilege to introduce the first bass player for the oxbow incidents none other than the incredible super talented it gives me great pleasure to introduce <laughs> my great friend james h carr that's Jimmy, me how are you brother i'm good howie i'm good i'm glad to see you you're one of the few left you know, I was thinking about that a little while ago, uh, of all the people that started in high school, it, it, who's still going? Who's still at it? And those that are actually look pretty good. And and we actually looked pretty good back in the day, which, which you know, put a leg up on the competition. And in fact, I'll blow your mind right here. Oh, man. Here is a picture of the Oxbow incidents. Yeah, and, now th that's right. Now that is, of course, that's me there. But that's that's Fox Point. That's the old salvage yard in Providence, Rhode Island, right down on the bay on the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. It's, I think it's swanky condos there now or something. Yeah, it's Indian Point or something. India um, Point, that's it. Right? India Point. India Point Park. And right. uh, Dave, Todd Urbanist, Dave Brooks on the drums. Uh, me over here playing at the Bastille in Newport, Rhode Island for a dollar and a quarter a night. Uh, wow. Yeah, not well, bad. You know, inflation since then has been almost a factor of 10, so gives you an idea. Yeah, well, we 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 might be getting 15 bucks a ticket right now, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'll tell you what, we had been struggling for a bass player. We had Bob Wiegand on the piano, and he used to play the bass with his left hand. And then we had tiny Paul Lister as our singer. He was our first singer. We tried to make him play bass, but it was just too much. And I auditioned a guy over the phone from Moses Brown uh, prep school named Chip Tucker. Right, and, I remember Chip. Right, and I, I said... Uh, we had a black Baldwin, no, black Hagstrom bass. That's right. That's right. And and he played As Tears Go By, uh, a Beatles song, on the phone for me. And I said, you're Rolling hired. Stones, dude. That's the Rolling Stones. Oh, yeah. That's right. The Rolling Stones, As Tears Go By. Well, I think Marianne Faithful recorded it. Uh, yeah. And, and the, I think it might be a Lennon-McCartney song, but I think the Stones... Oh, I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe it, it's really a Lennon McCartney song. I don't know. Yeah, it was the Stones that recorded it, though. They were they were tight with Marianne Faithful. Um, well, she but, did a she did a version too, I think. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but we were we were really strapped for a, a good bass player. And in July of 1966, you moved in two doors down from our keyboard player. Right from Bob Wiegand. Bob Wiegand. I remember one morning, probably was a Saturday, although since it was summer, it might have been a weekday. Uh, must have been, actually, it was probably a weekday. I heard this I heard this music and somebody playing drums. And I knew it was a band, you know, because it was because it sucked, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in 1966, music was not everywhere. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but now music is so ubiquitous and free and you know, you want any, you want to hear anything, you just grab your phone. But so I heard this and I walked down the street and I saw these these three kids in a breezeway. Remember what breezeways? Uh, a connector between the garage. It's like not quite a garage band. It's a breezeway band, you know. <laughs> and, the, the breeze kings. The breeze kings. That's good. Um, anyway, so there is this kind of weird looking guy with curly blonde hair and really bad zits, Bob, and this other squirrely guy playing these red drums, and the drummer was really terrible. But the keyboard player was pretty good, actually. And I said, oh, hi, I live down the street. Uh, I play the bass, my name's Jim. And Bob said, well, if you got an amp, go get your amp and your bass and come on down. So I did, and we, I don't know what we played, but we jammed for a while. 
was probably like, you know, hang on Sloopy or something really exciting like that. But um, then he, to he told me about your band. Mm -hmm. And so I drove down there in my mom's car with my, I don't, I actually, I don't think I had my instruments with, you, with me. I can't remember. No, I had my bass. That's right. I didn't, didn't have the amp with me. I can't remember that. You know, it's, that's what happens when you get old. Anyway, I heard Chip play. He wasn't too bad. I think the first thing you guys played was House of the Rising Sun. A classic for everybody. A classic for everybody. A first, a first time for everyone. And I, as I recall, Bob had a, um, a Farfisa duo compact, a two manual Farfisa. The red one. Right. And, and a Baldwin Eliminator amp. Right, it was a ball. It was a really weird Baldwin amp because it had a, a twelve and a fifteen. Yeah, God knows why. Um, and it was it was really heavy. It was quite loud. It was a keyboard amp actually, but it would work as a bass amp. Um, it was solid state. I remember it very well. You don't see them around very much anymore. No, but they were good. They're good amps. Yeah, yeah, and. Um... And we obviously jammed a little bit. And I'm sure we said we kind of Dave, Dave Brooks and John Holsher on rhythm guitar. We looked at each other and said, we got to get this guy. We got to get this guy. It's the answer to all our problems. It's the silver uh, bullet. Yeah, I don't know if that was true, but um <laughs> We, we did have a song list of 125 songs. Eventually, <laughs> by the time we knocked it off, anyway. You know, I yeah, I, and I I sent you a, a couple of years ago, back when they had the the, or maybe it was 10 years ago when they had the 40th. Re How long ago was the 40th reunion? That was 2008. Yeah. Or 2018. Okay. No, when that was the 50th. 40th was 2008. Anyway, I sent you a list of everything I could remember we ever played. It was a lot of songs. It really was. But you know, the, you know it's a really kind of tragic thing. Um, we, we never believed in ourselves enough to really do any of our, much of our own music. I mean, we did a lot of jams and everything, but um, it, it just seemed somehow impossible to write your own music. Uh, and now, of course, everybody and, and their dog sits down with their phone and creates an album, you know. <laughs> I, I, I recall Chip Tucker and I wrote a song called Silver Studded Phantom. And, oh. we, and we went up to Myron Arnold at the Crown Hotel in Providence. Oh. And, he, and he had a little four track studio in there. And we recorded that uh, along with a song called Blind Man's Burden that Jack Ryan, our singer's brother, wrote. Right. No, I nothing. remember that name. I never heard the song, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we recorded. I don't know if, probably Bob had a copy of the record. Because Ma Moskowitz, she used to hang on to everything. Right. Um, but uh, what, are, what are some of the early gigs that you recall? Well, before that, we were, me and you and Jack Ryan, our lead singer, were all sophomores at Barrington High School together. What? So I guess you're right. It was the fall of 60s. Oh, no, I think we were, weren't we juniors? Um, when I moved there? 60, no, 60, 66 and then 17. I don't, I don't know, but the first Cream album. Fresh we were, juniors. we were we were juniors. Yeah, because we started we start we finished our senior year in '68. Right. So that means we started the junior year in '67, and the sophomore year in '66. Right. Right. Uh, and in those days, home rooms were always. Wait, wait a minute. That's that's. Wait a minute. We started our senior year in '67. We right. started our junior year. In '66, so we were juniors. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. So you came into the homeroom, which were organized alphabetically um, at the time. So people like Ann McKenney, 
and Sandy McLaughlin, which actually they turned out to be Scottish. Uh, all the all the McDonald's and McGregor's, you know, we're, we're all in there together, um, which was interesting. But you walked into the room, and right on my desk, you plopped down the first Fresh Cream album, <laughs> and I said, "Man, I'm coming over after school. We're going to listen to this." And right, we, isn't it amazing? Like you couldn't just hear music everywhere all the time. No, no, not at all. In fact. We were very lucky. Um, I thought just yesterday, I had a song, the first song by the Youngbloods um, called uh, Grizzly Bear. When I woke up this morning, she was gone, solid gone. She used to sit and watch me dance that Grizzly Bear. I guess I'll go to Frisco where I'll dance it there because when I woke up this morning, she was gone. and. And so that turned us on to um, the Young Bloods, but right. but it probably got played maybe twice because <laughs> you know experimental music like that. And this was AM radio, WPRO, no right. at the time, right? So obviously no cell phone, no internet, nothing like that. Rotary phones. Um, right. uh, it also, uh, I recall. When are you? No, Axis Bold as Love came out. Right. And me and you and Dave, we were in your garage and we were playing it. And it was in the Axis part uh, where it launched into that really heavy part. And we were just like, our minds were blown. It was just, you know, and we had heard, and Jimmy said, You will never hear surf music again. You will never hear surf music again. Yeah. Well, you might hear it, but you won't hear it the same way. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. We, we spent a lot of time in your basement, as I recall, where you had set up your bedroom. Um, yeah. Under a, ba a bamboo curtain, sort of nail some bamboo. That's right. Uh, that's right. And uh, we had the drums on there. After we moved out of Rumstick Point, uh, right. I think we moved that summer, in fact, uh, right. that we first met. Um, Incidentally, we spent so long getting set up. I just got the five minute warning. Uh, so, <laughs> so what should we? What do we do when that when it runs out? We we talk right up until it, we go. Oh, okay, we're, we're, we're gone. <laughs> and then I I'll, then I fire up the second meeting and we join there. All right. Okay. Hey, uh, uh, and. I have to go get something too before before the second one starts. I have my I have my high school picture, which you will get a real laugh out of. Okay, yeah, it's a yearbook I, picture. Yeah, but I have I, a little framed version of it that I don't know somebody sent me. My mother, that, or my sister sent it to me. I think. Oh, that's pretty cool. I lost my yearbook uh, when my moving van was hijacked, moving back to Muscle Shoals. Oh, um, but somebody, uh, Susie Davidson from the high school, she said, I didn't care about mine at all. I'll send you mine. I said, okay, that would be great. So, so I got one in abstentia. Yeah. Now, so I would love, love it if you could show more pictures of the OBIs too, because I don't have that one. The, if you could scan that, that uh, one out of the, the Providence Journal or whatever that was in, I'd love it. I will. Um, I, I I have a, a black and white of us playing in Bob's living room with Chip on the bass. You can see Moses Brown and you can see Dave and whatnot. I have very few pictures of the band. Um, right. Well, it, and that's another big difference between then and now, because now, of course, everybody takes picture of what they're a picture of what they're having for breakfast. You know. It, uh, but, oh, look! There's a butterfly. Right. And back back then, it was like we even kind of had us. I mean, a lot of people didn't like being photographed. It was like, oh, you know, no, no, don't no pictures. You know, it was right now. It's like it's all people do. It's pretty I, weird. I, I, and, and then you if you were lucky enough to have a camera, right? You, you'd get maybe 16 pictures on it. So you right. wouldn't want to waste one. And now we. We just pick this up and take 30 pictures of our, you know, 
And boy, that hat looks really great. Let me <laughs> let me photograph it from this angle. Right. It's, it's incredible. So, what, do, do you recall your first jobs that we did? Um. Hmm. Well, I don't don't know if it was. Let's see. I. I where did we rehearse before those gigs? Uh, did we, re we I know we rehearsed a rum stick a little bit, but then we must have rehearsed down in your basement, right? That's right. That's right. We, we, and uh, Dave actually taught my brother Kevin how to play drums. Right. Um. Uh, so I think we, I, a, a lot of the early stuff that we did, as I recall, were high school dances and also frat parties and i'm trying to remember what the earliest one i don't well what's the first one you remember with with the band um uh, i i definitely remember sigma nu at brown university um, uh, yeah that that's i think we played there a couple times right we we did i don't know if you were with us the night that there uh, we were set up on this big red rug and and Dave said, boy, I sure could use a rug like this to put my drums on when we play. And somehow we rolled up the rug and I put my top hat on top of the rug and we 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 carried I it was, out like like a Marx Brothers thing. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. I remember that. Yeah, and then I got a call a week later. Hey, you guys haven't seen our rug. Uh, maybe it got caught up with our equipment. We'll check. We, we we dropped it off, you know. We we're bad kids sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I remember those parties at Brown being a kind of. I, I mean, I still just when I describe them to people, which I, I guess are pretty memorable. It was like, it was kind of like Animal House, but and and one was actually a toga party, as I recall. Yes. Yes. And it was, and it was before the Blues Brothers, like twenty five years before the Blues Brothers. That's um, true. And or more, yeah. And but it was just a, a sea of spilled uh, orange juice, orange juice, and barf and beer. And the orange juice was because of the vodka screwdrivers. Everyone was drinking screwdrivers, whiskey sours, or beers. That's what they were drinking. Yeah, that's right. And so there was, and there was always a lot of barf, uh, a lot of really intoxicated kids. Mm -hmm. Particularly the girls. I, f I felt bad for them, actually. But I do, re I do, I do remember on a set on a Sunday morning, mom coming to the top of the stairs and said, Howie, are you coming to church? And I kind of rolled over on top of my date. Put my no, ma, not today. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, let's yeah. see. Um, uh, we we played. Uh, we played it. Didn't we play at um, Salve Regina, which I think we referred to as Save Your Vagina. Uh, All girls college. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we may have played there. Um, uh, but we we also did. I remember some, some, there wasn't some place called Mesquamica we played. Um, a country club, I think, there. Maybe. Or, we, or we, also, we played some country club over in Warwick or Cranston. The Edgewood Yacht Club. Yacht we, Club, that's right. That, that oh, was, you, know, that's what our, you know what our first gigs were? Probably the Barrington Yacht Club. Oh, yeah. That, that was really prestigious, playing Satisfaction and Gloria. Uh, <laughs> Right. Midnight hour. And I remember I remember when we were playing at, at Brown, the students would yell they wanted to hear music by the young rascals. And and we very grudgingly played a number of their songs. But good good loving. Right. But I remember I really hated that music. I just yeah. didn't but maybe it's because they didn't have a bass player. That could be one. <laughs> could have been. We we gravitated towards the Yardbirds and the Stones and the Kinks, guitar oriented music mostly. And the Who, the Who, and the Who. Yeah, we we didn't start playing my generation until you came to town. That was my idea, baby. 
That's right. Uh, we were in a big battle of the bands at Sugarberries, which was Crescent Park. Uh, and that was the ballroom, the Alhambra ballroom, actually. Huh. And uh, you could always tell from the stage when a fight broke out. Because you'd see maybe 500 kids and all of a sudden it would be like the Red Sea parted. <laughs> and and people would be duking it out. But we were playing against the merging traffic. I think maybe my friend Bob Angel, who's got Bob Angel's Blues Outlet, the only Ville Stomp, uh, his group, the Yeoman, and uh, some other uh, groups. And Bob's still at it today. He just released a new blues album. Mm -hmm. uh, but we went up to do My Generation, and somebody had slit Dave's snare drum head. I remember that. Oh, and weird. That, right? And that was our closing number, and we knocked everything over and threw the smoke bombs out and all that. But, but I don't think we won the battle, though. No, no, we, we never but did. I remember something about that. Maybe, now, maybe this wasn't that particular gig, but it was in the Alhambra Ballroom at, um, what was the name of that park? Uh, River Crescent Park. park. Crescent park. park. Yeah. Now, I saw a question, question mark in the Mysterians there. 96 tears. I went. I don't know if you were with me. I don't think so. But I, we played, uh, I guess maybe I have these things kind of mixed up in my mind. I remember hearing Linda Ronstad there. Um, but I thought that was, I thought we were playing the same night. But it must be that I've, I've kind of got the battle of the bands and her performance mushed together in my mind. But I do remember from the Battle of the Bands that we didn't have our own amps. We had to use amps that were on stage. Yeah, yeah. You remember that? Yes, that was real crap. Uh, it was totally crap. The The bass amp was a, a Vox Foundation 118, and the speaker was blown. It was just like... I, I, was, <laughs> do, you re, do you remember the time we went to Boston with some other guys in the band and with some girl and she cooked chicken for you and somebody's in you know, in, an, in, a, in an unoccupied apartment building like on Beacon Street somewhere. Remember that? Uh, did, we didn't drop in on Ralph Garvey, did we? Well, that maybe, but I know that, I think that was a different instance. And I think you got in big trouble for putting peanut butter in his plants or something. Oh, <laughs> no, I don't remember that one. Um, yeah, we did some pretty weird shit. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's, is that picture down on Fox, in Fox Point? Is that where that was? Yes, Fox Point in Providence. There used to be an old scrapyard there. I, and they had a, there was a club called The Jail down there. I right. met, we, we heard rhinoceros there. We went, yes, we loved rhinoceros. They were awesome. Oh, what a group. Billy <laughs> Monday. That's, uh, that's the Fender. Oh, yeah. Man, I had one exactly like that, and I had to trade it for studio time for my, for my third blues album, Finger Licking Blues. The engineer gave me a thousand bucks for it. And so like two weeks later, I had the money and I said, Ron, I'm ready to get my bass back. He said, no, you can't have that back. I made all the modifications to it. <laughs> well, what, was it a jazz bass or? A it, was a, it was a jazz. Right. I, I got, I think I got it at Rhode Island Music, in fact. At, I've, I've, I've taught music theory, in particular ear training and sight singing at Columbia, at Stanford, at uh, San Francisco State, the University of Kentucky. I was a, you know, I was a slave, you know, for really, really crappy wages, teaching kids to hear and to read, you know, hear yeah. music and to read it. And one of the things they had to do was take dictation, which means I'd play something on the piano and they had to write it down. Mm -hmm. It was hard. Yeah. And, but I, I had discovered because of my study at, I, I studied at Manus College in New York for a while, which was a great conservatory back in the day. Um, I discovered that the French um, method of the early part of the 20th century that all these teachers had written 
contrived exercises for dictation. So <laughs> those contrived exercises, which contrived is usually a bad word, right? But contrived is good in this case, because mm -hmm. what these people knew is that for, for a musician to learn to take dictation, if you just throw real music at them, it's too damn hard. You need something that's like, dun, 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 dun. You know, something really easy, right? Mm -hmm. And so this stuff gradually got harder. And I, so I used this stuff. I used it at Stanford and at Columbia and uh, San Francisco State and at, at, to a certain extent in the University of Kentucky. They, they had a very different system. But so I, I was very familiar with teaching kids to take dictation, to, to write counterpoint, to write harmony, but also sight singing. And sight singing, contrary to what it sounds like, it sounds like you would have to sight read what you're reading, but it's not that, you prepare it. And there are always those kids who could not match pitch, all right? Mm -hmm. And I used to, I used to, when I was teaching them, I used to think back to you, and I used to th well, Howie, how he always had trouble matching pitch, but he always seemed to be able to make some progress toward, toward that, you know, toward, toward getting better. And right. so I was always convinced that these kids could make progress. And some did, and mm -hmm. some didn't. But you were one who did. You yeah. had, your problem was simple, that you just didn't have enough exposure to music when you were really little. Right. You know, for whatever reason, in school or in your families, there wasn't a lot of singing. And so you had to learn it, you know, it took time. But for some kids, they have an, there's an area of the brain involved with matching pitch. And if it's not as, as capable and as, as enlarged, if you will, as it is in many musicians, they can't really, they can't really get there, you know? Right. Anyway, but well, you did it. You did it. It's, it's very cool, actually. Well, thank you. Um, the way I figured it out was one day I was recalling a song. And I, and I sang it and I said, well, this, this is right. And I went and grabbed my guitar and I was singing in like B for instance, or right. maybe C. Right. And uh, as, as a guitar player, you want your songs to be in E or A because you have that open string and you got right. that rock and roll vibe. Right. So right. I, I would, I was trying to sing in the wrong key all the time. Wow. For for sixty years, practically, wow. uh, and and finally, within the last year and a half, I I realized, just like Muddy Waters, I can sing this register, and this pitch, and I can rearrange them, wow. and then depending on if my melody starts on the seventh, on the tonic, on the third, on the fifth then I just know I've got to transpose to this key because I, and still be in that comfort range. Right. Right. But before I just, it was too dumb to, to figure it out or too high or something. You know? well, I, but I think also that, that a lot of it has to do with all the experience that you've had, you know, it, 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 it's, it's ear training, you know, playing yeah. music trains your ears. It, it's a slow and painful process. Yeah, it is. I oddly enough, in '74, I took sight singing at LACC. I I got an A in the class, but that wasn't hard to do. Um, but what what oh in in California? Yeah, in, oh, in wow. LA, at Los Angeles City College. Wow. I, I took a semester of classical guitar um, and and sight singing, and it was interesting to see. The, the musical lines and the steps that you had to climb up or down to reach that pitch, okay. right? And when you know your instrument and you, you can visualize, I can play that on the guitar. Why can't I sing it? Oh, because I'm trying to sing it in the wrong key. My, that's not where my range is. So, uh, so eventually it, it started to come and uh, I'm finally starting to realize my dream is uh, as being basically a solo acoustic guitar player, singer, songwriter. Nice. Uh, right. So I, I love playing solos and like that. Don't get me wrong. 
but but being able to do the whole thing yourself. Well, there's a lot to be said for that. That's that's you know I after after the OBIs and um, let's see I guess I went off to college. We 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 sort of kept going for a while, but then um, everybody was scattered, you know, uh, yeah. and uh, so I. I left school when I, you know, I went to Northeastern in Boston. I left school, and when I moved back to Rhode Island, I got in this band, Thunder Chicken, and uh, Snuffy Smith was the, who, who was a state policeman for years up in Vermont or something, afterwards. But um, Snuffy kind of freaked out at the end, but he, he was a pretty good band leader in that we had all these gigs. It was unbelievable. We used to play. What was that? I was. Uh, it was a place down in, in. Was it in Bristol or Warren? Um, phone booth was in War. Was in Warren. What was it called? The phone booth. Now then, I think this one must have been in in Bristol. It was one that um, that that was re. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, so we we would play like four or five nights a week. You know, for months there and it was just completely packed all the time um and the amount of money i, I was making it was obscene it was like a hundred dollars a night yeah where were you like, living yeah and this and it was this is like 1971 so wow. that i that's mean big money. that's big but it was really big money so 500 dollars a week you know um mm -hmm. and no taxes it was all under the table don't tell anybody um uh, uh Statute of limitations run out. But it made a big difference because for me because I, I bought a stereo. I rented an apartment in Providence uh, up in, on, in College Hill on Barnes Street. Um, uh, it, was a, it was a building that H.P. Lovecraft used to live in. Oh. Of course, he lived in almost all the buildings, it turns out. But uh, I, I bought an electric piano. I started taking string bass lessons. I bought a string bass, which, oh, that's the other thing. I wanted to do this. Aha! Straight cast. Cool, man. So I, I learned to play upright, although I'm incredibly rusty now. I can barely play it anymore. I played in the orchestra at college at the various schools I was in, and then uh, I, I got a, a master's degree from Queens College, City University of New York. I studied music composition there, and um, I was lucky because I, when I when I went to Queens College, I, I picked it because a bunch of the guys who taught there had had written the theory textbooks that I used when I was an undergrad. Mm. So I was studying with these amazing people like uh, Leo Kraft and Hugo Weisskall and George Pearl and um, Carl Schachter. I mean, Henry Weinberg. They were, they were all amazing musicians, uh, particularly George Pearl and Hugo Weisskall. They were really, really superb composers and, and great musicians. They could, either of them could sit down at the piano and pretty much sight read, you know, a full orchestral score or an opera sco score from the or from the orchestra score, they could just reduce it at sight and play. It was, you know, stuff like that. It's really amazing, uh, which was the standard actually in the old days to be yeah. a real musician. You had to be able to do that. You know, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's, that's incredible. Uh, so here we are. What is it? Sixty years. After basically we started playing music, I started age fourteen. Uh, I I was uh, I was I think I was thirteen. Yeah, uh, my mom actually had a beautiful voice and could play the acoustic guitar, and she would sing around the house. She got it I think when I was twelve or thirteen. Wow! So in the summer of sixty four, Skip Whitehead, my neighbor, came over. And he said, hey, I'm taking guitar lessons at Rick Silva's Guitar Studio in Riverside. Oh, yeah. 275 or 175 a half an hour. 
I pleaded with my mom to pay for the lessons. And I, I went through Alfred's basic guitar method, one through four, from right. September through Christmas. And then the Beatles hit on Ed Sullivan, February. And I took that music book and just like threw it over my shoulder. Uh, did you ever play any? Did, well, I'm trying to remember if the uh, OBI's Oxbow Instance, if we ever played anything by the Ventures. Did we do we, like Walk, walk we, Don't Run? We did Walk Don't Run and Wipe Out. That's right. Right. Uh, on my first band job, this was before you were in, we played at the Harrisville Civic Center for 40 bucks. There were seven of us, and we called ourselves the Seagram Seven. <laughs> and and, and Ed, Ed Riccio was the drummer who ended up playing drums for Gary Aldrich's band, but Ed couldn't play Wipeout. So Bob Wiegand, who was a drummer before he was a keyboard player, <laughs> got over and played the drums on Wipeout. And then we did Walk, Don't Run. And when it came to the bridge, John didn't know the bridge, so he reached down to his little Gibson amp and just flipped it on standby and did that, and then we go back to did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, flipped it back on A minor G F E. But yeah, the I remember once we were sitting around in Bob Wiegand's living room on Nayat Road, and it must have been a weekend because his dad was around, and I, I think maybe, maybe we rehearsed it in his. That's right, we used to rehearse in their garage sometimes. And his living room. Right in the living room. And we, we'd sit around there and listen to uh, Sergeant Pepper. And one, one day we were there, it was an afternoon, and we'd heard that the Beatles were going to be on TV. So we turned on the television, and it was a, live via satellite. It was the Beatles and all those, this huge crowd of people doing All You Need Is Love. Oh, yeah. We saw them. It was Bob and me. I think you were there, and I think John was there. We, our, they all, though the other funny thing about that, I remember that Bob's dad at once one point said something to Dave Brooks like, well, maybe someday you can learn how to play with real swing. Like you know? Tom Morello. He's each right, other. right, exactly. Well, the drummer has to learn how to swing, man. That's Get right. Get to swing. Get to swing. Dave and we're all going like, what? Yeah, Dave, <laughs> we had Dave, no idea what he meant. <laughs> yeah. Right, Dave had like three three beats. Uh, then those were in the days where uh, Bob's dad wouldn't let him come to practice until he waxed the car. Well, <laughs> now didn't didn't Bob? He he moved to California and started a business of some kind of some kind of retail business. Golf right? selling golf equipment. That's right. At, and on my second album, Forest on Fire, I learned he was down in Tampa or Miami at a golf show. And I said, Bob, why don't you, he said, I got a layover in Atlanta, like all night. And I said, great, I'll pick you up at the airport. We'll go to the studio. You can play on some tracks and then I'll take you back. That's now true. I haven't seen him in quite a while. So I pulled up to, where the, the passenger exit was, I saw a guy standing there. I said, hey, buddy, do you know if the, the plane from Miami has come in? He said, yeah, I was just on it. And I said, Bob? And, and it was Bob, his hair had all fallen out. Uh, then many years later, I was going to see my old guitar buddy, Bobby Zinner in Palm Springs, and Bob had a gig, a solo gig, playing the Hammond at a nightclub. Wow. He said, I call my own shots. This is my own gig. And me and Bobby Zinner walked in and he, he played like the last three notes of the night and and ended. We were late. Um, we, <laughs> we, had, we had actually come from, uh, you remember Robin Trower, Bridge and Size? Yeah. Um, well, his drummer was a guy named Bill Lord over here right and he started the he had blt right well, bobby and then me there in the middle we were just at bill's studio jamming oh. so we were a little late but 
uh, I thought, gee, I got a chance to play with Robin Trower's drummer. Well, it was that or Bob Wiegand. So. Bob Wiegand, you know, we were in, <laughs> I was a little late getting there. So mo most of them are gone, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, Jack is still around. What about Bruce? Ga Bruce is still around, right? Right. I um, I see Bruce on Facebook. I'll put up a, a post on, believe it or not, I'm, I'm posting a lot on TikTok because it's a lot less hassle than doing all the SEOs, the search engine optimization, and all of this other good stuff that YouTube wants. Uh, well, and sometimes Instagram is only a minute, but they'll they'll cut your song off, but they'll they'll play it on Facebook. So because they're owned by Meta. So Bruce has started commenting, oh, this is a great jam. Oh, I used to play with you, oh, blah, blah, blah. So I, I dropped him a note. I said, Bruce, I'm doing these interviews with the old band guys. What do you say? Right. And he never wrote back. <laughs> oh, that sucks. Yeah, uh, I, I just found out a, a couple of years ago that Ross Jenks had died. Yeah. Um, that my was bro very, my very brother, brother Steve sent me his obit from the Barrington Times. Yeah. And I looked at his picture for Ross. What, is, what did he look like? I, I didn't see any of those pictures. If you can imagine his high school picture with kind of the long hair. They used to call me and him the Rosenbush brothers. I know. I remember. And I was Bush and he was Rose. And, and here you and I are at 70. I'm 74. You will be soon. No, and, I'm 74. I was 74 in January. Oh, okay. So, oh, you're older than me. Yeah, hey, I know somebody that's older than me. Ha, ha, ha. You're an old man. Ha, ha. That's for sure. Got the white hair to prove it. I know it, but at least you still got it, you know. Well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I'll tell you one disadvantage of having all this hair is a lot of people say the following to me. Excuse me, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. It used to piss me off. I just go, yeah, hi. <laughs> I just ignore it. Yeah, um, yeah. So when we started, there were just record players, the phonograph. Right then, there were there were tape recorders, but but nobody ever we nobody had one, you know. Actually, my dad got a, a tape of Jimmy Blue Eyes from the CBS Radio Workshop, and and he had a little, you know, one of those tiny little reel to reels with right. with one of those little pencil neck microphones, right? And the three inch reels, right? Yeah. Here was the record that uh, if I can get the sun off it. Uh, there we go, Forest on Fire, yeah. that, that Bob played on. Who's your bass player on that? Um, that was actually Mark Kaplan. He was really loved Iron Maiden. And that guy who played Bruce Dickerson. So when I first moved here to Richmond in 83, I joined a club band. And after one month, the girl singer moved to Florida and Mark and Scott, who was an 18-year-old double bass, just unbelievable drummer, we started a trio called Valhalla. And we wrote all songs that were like historical. Like we wrote about the Civil War and the Incan civilization and the Vikings. And we, <laughs> we, we thought we might be the first rock band to, to be featured on PBS, you know. <laughs> But but we, cool. we 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 finally had a showcase with John Bon Jovi's uncle Tony Bon Jovi at the Power right. Station in New York, right. and uh, we had a guy who set it up for us, and we were I mean we worked eight years rehearsing wow. and writing for this thing, wow. and wow. Uh, and Mark called me up a week before the showcase and he said, I can't do the showcase. It was supposed to be nine o'clock on a Friday. All the okay. record companies were there. They were going to film it, everything. I said, how come? He said, well, you know, I'm Jewish, right? I said, yeah. You haven't been to the temple since we met. What about it? He said, well, it's Friday night. It's Yom Kippur. All right. Wow. And, um, you know, the Sabbath. And, you know, I'd be doomed to go to hell if I played the showcase. I said, you're, you're going to be in hell a lot quicker than that if you don't play that show. <laughs> so did he play it? Nope. No. Uh, no. Uh, so 
you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, I guess. Perhaps, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and it was bad. But then I moved to Atlanta and became king of the blues in Atlanta after That's uh, good. started my own label down there. And um, I got to play for 200,000 people at the Melbourne oh. Festival and 80,000 people at the, no, it was 80,000 at the Melbourne Art Festival and 200,000 at the Coca-Cola Riverwalk Festival. Yeah, I've I've played some really strange gigs over the years. One was, and no, one was actually that that sort of Woodstock-like festival in North Dartmouth, Mass. Um, I was there with the hospital tent. Did you play there? Well, I don't know if it was the same year, but I I played there with. Um, My Nostris was there. The birds were there. Uh, the year I played, it was the Guess Who, Ten Wheel Drive, uh, and Sha Na Na. Mm. And we, I had a band with Jeff Thomas and we did like these sort of parody oldies. It was sort of like, you know, it was Jeff Thomas, Alan Kornhauser, Jim Whittle, me, and like three chicks. Uh -huh. Yeah. It, it was genuinely terrible, I must say. <laughs> but we played for, you know, 100,000 people. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, that was I, I, that was a several day festival. I remember my guitar buddy, Johnny Barnes, showed up and he set up a, a booth with hash pipes and beads and all kinds of stuff he was selling. It... That reminds me of two things I wanted to, to ask you about to see if you remember. Do you remember we used to get stoned and go to the as yet incomplete uh, uh, University of Massachusetts campus and like walk around in that construction? I ended up having to go to college there at the last minute because oh, I know, I, I know. I, it's I, a miracle, I, you know, we didn't get killed walking around in that construction site at night. Oh man, there were, I'd, I'd show up for school and the construction workers, you know, my hair was here, and they'd be yelling, "Hey, cutie," and this kind of stuff. I, but that, you know, the the architecture of that place is really—it's famous uh, for its brutalist architecture. It's really uh, quite amazing. But the, okay, so you remember that. Here's another one. Do you remember John Fox? John Fox. The name sounds familiar. But... He, he, had a, he had a VW convertible, and he lived there, and, and I don't think he was your roommate, but he was a friend of somebody's. We used to go to, over to his house and hear um, uh, Steve Miller, Children of the Future, and stuff like that, you know. But yeah. one night, we all got, we all smoked a bunch of hash. We got in his car and we went out for a drive and he was, we were driving down these country roads, back roads in New England. He would turn the lights off. And so we had the, the top down in this bug, the lights were off and all these bright stars up above. But it was just, a, he was just like doing it to scare the crap out of us. But, and I think it was the same night. Now, I'm, I know you must have been along. We were driving along, we're right near the water, and we take a turn, and we're out on this jetty. And it just goes for, it goes for like a half a mile across this bay to this town. And we drove, and the water is like lapping up on these big flat pieces of stone, and we're driving this bug over this jet. Do you remember that? Kind of, I think I was stoned. I think we were all stoned. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was dangerous. Wild. That was wild. I uh, never figured out where that actually was. I've looked at the map a million times. It really? was somewhere around Dartmouth or New Bedford, you know. Mm. Uh, our last gig was at the Orchid Room in New Bedford on Valentine's Day. That was. It showed some other band that said, next week, Valentine's Day, the Oxbow Incidents. What year? That must have been like 1969. 69. That that was our last official job. And that it was in Fall or New Bedford. Right. I do I rem I remember going there for a gig. You had an old Peugeot, as I recall. I had the Peugeot 403, white. I, I loved it. Sunroof, five <laughs> feet on the floor. I bought right. it for 300 bucks from Steve Blodgett. That was a great car. That's right. Yeah, I remember Steve Blodgett. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember playing the gig though. I I I but I remember being in New Bedford quite a bit. Uh, yeah, the old days. 
I, w I wish I could figure out where that jetty was because I would love to go out and drive across it again. It was it was at night yeah. with the ocean splash, splashing over us almost. It was so weird. It was, the stuff we did. did some, we did some crazy stuff back in the day, for sure. Sometimes I think it's a miracle that we're still here. Well, it is. I mean, we didn't get... We didn't get we didn't spend much time in jail. I don't I don't think I spent any time in jail. And we didn't get injured in terrible automobile accidents. We didn't die of lung cancer, which is, you know, they that's were, what that's what killed Ross. I think it's also what killed um Sue and Dave. Yeah. Well, what about um yeah, both Sue Schoenfaber and Dave Brooks, they died of lung cancer, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I started smoking hanging around with those guys. It's a miracle it didn't kill me. Uh, you know, when I was 13, my dad said, if you don't smoke until you're 18, on your 18th birthday, right now cigarettes are 35 cents a pack. So I will give you the cost of, if you had spent 35 cents a day for five years every day, Nice. When I turned 18, he gave me a 375 bucks, and I bought a 55 strap with a maple neck at uh, a pawn shop in Central Square in Boston. Awesome. So tell the people what you're into. The thing I'm really interested in now, I have mentioned it earlier, is uh, I'm really interested in 18th century harpsichord music. And um, let's see if this works. I've queued up a little something you might be able to hear. Well, this will give you an idea. See if you can hear this. Um, see if it'll play. It's going to repeat that. I'm warning you. <laughs> This is, this is something I composed. A little bit more, not too much. That's probably enough. That's nice. That's nice. A long way from my generation. Indeed, a long way. And you know, it's, but that's, I mean, we're, so, we're in a lot of ways, we're really lucky because yeah. music, even though, I mean, we never became world famous or particularly rich, it gave us a way of thinking about, you know, the world and what we wanted from it and, um, it caused me to pursue education more than anything else. I really, I wanted to learn how to do what you just heard, which it takes an awful lot of study to actually do that. Um, so for me anyway, I, I, you know, I, don't, I was never much, I was never much of a pianist, I'm sad to say, but uh, I'm much better now than I ever was. Well, good. At 74. <laughs> well, congratulations on staying at it, Jim. Well, it, <laughs> It took a lot of work. <laughs> I wish we lived closer so we could hang out a little bit. It would be great. It um, would be great. Do you want, if anybody wanted to get in touch with you, is that allowed or? Um, sure. Sure they can, by all means. Okay. Uh, how would they do that? Re respond? Well, you, you can, probably the best way to reach me is email. Okay. Uh, James.h.car at gmail.com. Uh, okay. I'm a, pretty impervious to scams, so I, I'm not worried about it. All right, great, great. Well, Jim, thanks for taking all this time, brother. It's so good to see you after a while. Well, it's an honor to, to have somebody actually make a fuss over over uh, my past, and, and we, had, we had an awful lot of fun, and you know, the uh, OBI's was really where my, my musical life really, I mean, it kind of is the, the root of it, 
I mean, I started with music before, but it was really there that I, I just became completely committed to it. And I think that's probably true for you, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you are a great member of the Oxbow Incidents, brother, and you're a and great you're the leader, man. And I will just say this to all of the fans. Keep a song in your head, love in your heart, and I will see you down the musical story highway on the next adventure of the old time rock and roller. Very so well. long, my friends. <laughs> Bye, Howie. Thank you. Bye.